Uh, great to be here and see everyone. And uh, back here after 23 years, I, was <laughs> I did this just after grad school uh, for myself. So um, yeah, so um, I'm gonna. Oh, is there a white chalk actually? Let me. Oh, here. Okay. I see it. Yeah. Great. 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 Right, so, um, so, so as uh, recently promised, I will talk about field arithmetic and Galois cohomology. Um, I, uh, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to give an outline of, of all my lectures, but I think I'm just going to go ahead and do it and just say what I, what I plan to, to do. So um, lecture one uh, today mostly is going to be an overview of... Um, let's say, um, of what we care about and why. I'm, trying to, I'm gonna try to set up, uh, frame some of the basic um, structural problems in um, Galois cohomology, at least from my own kind of uh, particular biased slant. Um, in uh, lecture two, I want to talk about the kind of um, various relationships um, between um, Galois cohomology and um, other um, measurements of um, what you might call the complexity of field arithmetic. Field. So I'm sure you have no idea what I'm writing here, but is it is it vaguely is the size okay? Is it vaguely legible? I can read it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, lecture. So these first two lectures um, are going to be for the most part um, uh, field agnostic. You know, we will these will be kind of general stuff about like various fields, you know, fields in general, not specific fields. Um, lecture three, I'm going to um, try to focus more sharply on the, um, on the period index problem, um, particularly for the Brouwer group. Um, and let's say, specific field arithmetic. So that is the arithmetic of specific fields, I guess I should say. Um, so I'll still talk about a range of different fields in lecture three, but, uh, but at least in the second half, the, the goal will be to aim um, towards this particular technique of um, field patching. Um, which involves a class of fields that have been called, for better or worse, semi-global fields. And then finally, lecture four um, will, will be more about field patching and, um, let's say, um, higher period index problems. All right. So... Um, Now, this is, um, I guess, though, a, a summer school on, like, motivic uh, cohomology and stuff like that. So, um, so I, I want to, like, um, recall a, a story um, that my father told me um, when I was younger. I don't know where he got this story, actually, but he said, um, okay, so the story goes, you know, once upon a time, there was this, you know, young uh, person who lived in this village, and he decided that he wanted to know what, you know, the meaning of life was. He wanted to uh, learn about what is, like, what is fate, what is destiny, what, what is this all about, right? And um, so it becomes a, a wanderer, wanders far and wide, seeking answers to these problems. Eventually, um, 
this uh, young person is told that actually, you know, if you really want to know the answer to these problems, you have to go into these caves up in the hill and seek out this hermit who knows the answers to these problems. He's been, you know, thinking about this for quite a long time. So he, after, you know, a long time, he finds these caves and finds this old, you know, hermit living in, living in the cave. And he says, Master, what is fate? And the master replies, it is that which we carry with us, what brings us from place to place. It is that which causes the toil of beasts of burden. It is that which men in former times had to bear upon their backs. It is that which caused nations to build byways from city to city upon which carts and coaches pass. I had to write this down because I thought it would, it would be better if I wrote it down, okay. Um, and alongside, and alongside these byways, inns have been built to stave off hunger, thirst, and weariness. And the wanderer says, and that is fate? And the master replies, uh, fate? I, I thought you said freight. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the wanderer says, that's all right. I wanted to know about freight, too. <laughs> and so, uh, the point of the story, of the story <laughs> is, you, you might have come here for fate, but I'm hoping that you'll, you know, sometimes you need a little freight along the way, right? So, I mean, you know, okay, so it's not, it's not motivic homology that I'm doing, right? It's not totally irrelevant to motivic homology, and there's been some rich interactions over the years between Galois homology and motivic um, homotopy theory, motivic homology. But, um, but you know, I mean, sometimes when you're doing math, you you need to care about freight too. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, with that in mind, <laughs> you know, I'm asking for your patience, right? Okay, so um, so I, I, I really, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I have no idea how to really aim these lectures properly. So, um, so I, I, I think, um, which is probably okay, because I don't think I would actually do very well at getting, hitting my target if I was aiming anyways, right? But so, uh, anyways, I thought that what we might do, is um, just take kind of an interest, just a, a walk together. So, so let's start with with what we might mean. So this, where we're, you know, the topic is field arithmetic and Galois homology. So what what do we mean by field arithmetic? So um, I, let me say a reasonable working definition. I think is. Um, to answer the question, um, which systems of equations um, do or don't have solutions? Okay. So if somebody gives you a field, you're wondering what kind of equations you can solve. And um, you know, so um, so maybe the, your equation is, you know, some polynomial and lots of variables is zero. Maybe it's it's equal to some value b or whatever. Or maybe it's some complicated system with a lot of equations. Um, and but let's let's start out by just um, imagining kind of how this looks if we do this in a totally stupid way. Bear with me, and just count from degrees. Okay. So like, what if you have like degree one systems? Okay, linear stuff. Okay, nothing going on, right? You know, you just count dimension, yes, no, everything's fine. Um, degree two, now we're in the realm of uh, quadratic forms. Um, and we already get kind of some really uh, rich phenomena, which, so this, just so you know what you're in for, okay? I'm, uh, I'm going to be like doing a kind of like random philosophical digression for about 15 minutes, okay? 
So we're going to talk, I'm, we're going to kind of like wind our way through kind of like some stuff about quadratic forms, going to see like a little cubic stuff, and then we'll, and then we'll give up. <laughs> and then we'll go, and then we'll go in a slightly different direction, okay? But I thought it'd be nice just to like kind of orient ourselves, right? Okay. So degree two, quadratic forms. So already um, we got this uh, really interesting uh, phenomena, um, which is uh, encapsulated by what's, we, what's called the U invariant problem. Which is just the question of when for a given field, so given a field, given a field F, um, Um, and a quadratic form um, Q. So this, this is just Q is a homogeneous degree two polynomial and lots of variables, maybe. Um, can we um, ensure Q equals zero um, has a, a non-trivial solution um, only knowing the uh, number of variables. Okay? So for example, um, you know, if, uh, if you're over, I don't know, the complex numbers, uh, sure. <laughs> you know, if you have like two variables, then you have a non-trivial solution. Um, if you're over, let's say, a, uh, a finite field, um, what you find is that um, if the number of variables uh, is at least three, um, then there exists a non-trivial um, solution. This is like a this is a fact that you can kind of do an elementary counting argument for, but it's not like something that's obvious in in any way. Um, so any you know quadratic polynomial in three variables over a finite field, like so, which you can uh, uh, think of as a, a plane conic, for example, is going to have a non-trivial solution that that plane conic. Um, okay, uh, if you have a, a number field, well, for a number field. Um, you have this kind of, uh, I don't know, unfortunate or interesting phenomena, which is called orderings. Uh, and so it's possible to have as many variables as you want and not have a solution. Like if you just have the diagonal like x1 squared plus x2 squared, et cetera, for that to have a non-trivial zero, everything has to be zero, right? So, so but that's, that's kind of a weird, I mean, the real numbers are a strange pathological phenomena which we're going to just kind of squint and try to ignore for a moment. And so at least if you have an imaginary number field, well, now you actually find um, via kind of some very famous results of, um, of, um, of Hasse and Minkowski, for example, that if the number of variables is at least five, then there is a non-trivial solution. Now, in general, we say that the U invariant of a field, um, let's say if F um, is so-called non-real, so that, that is, it doesn't have um, any, um, any way of being ordered by, you know, uh, by a notion of positives and negatives. OK, so if, if you're, if you're non-real, then this is a good definition. You can always make this definition, but it's kind of better to do it in that case. Uh, the U invariant is the maximal dimension of, a, um, of an anisotropic quadratic form. Anisotropic just means that there is no non-trivial solutions to it being equal to 0. So, um, so for a finite field, um, the U invariant would be two, because you can get two-dimensional things that don't, but three doesn't work. For an imaginary number field, the U invariant um, is four. Again, you can have four-dimensional forms, you just can't have five. Okay, 
And so, you know, we can, uh, we can try to keep going here. Um, and so, for example, you might ask what's, so, I don't know, this is like, this is kind of like a, a zero dimensional kind of animal, kind of in some vague sense, one dimensional, two dimensional. What if I go up and say, I don't know, like f of t or something like that, where f is an imaginary number field. Um, so we can say, like, you know, uh, is there, if you have enough variables, are you going to have a non-trivial zero? Um, what do you guys think? Uh, any guesses for what the number is? Okay. Okay. Mark says eight, because there, there's a pattern, right? Did it look like it's doubling, right? Looks like it's doubling. Okay, who, who, who thinks eight? Who thinks eight? <laughs> so. Okay, okay, right. let's, let, let's just take a quick poll, okay? I'm just making sure everybody is awake here and all that. Okay, so standard way of taking a poll, everybody raise your hand. No, everybody raise your hand first. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, now, if you think the answer is eight, keep your hand up. Okay. If you th now, so do you think the answer is who thinks it's bigger than eight? Okay. Okay. I'll stop torturing guys. Okay. But so, okay. This is um, this is unknown. Okay. It's 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 conjecturally eight, but it's not known whether or not it's finite at all. So as far as we know, there's like a three thousand dimensional form that has no non-trivial zeros. We just haven't found it yet. Um, we can find eight-dimensional forms that don't have zeros. Nobody's found nine-dimensional forms that don't have zeros. We don't believe they exist. But um, so already, like this becomes really hairy, right? Um, so um, as a um, as a as a kind of um, smaller case of this, I'll just mention, you know the. And a kind of an intermediate case that's kind of a warm-up to this was the the case of um, of piadic uh, curves, and this was a big open problem for a long time um, due to uh, a result of Saltman about Brouwer groups, which don't seem to be related. So um, I, I haven't told you what Brouwer groups are, and I'm I'm not assuming that you know, but I mean probably some of, a lot of you do, but I'll I'll say what they are later. But like using Brouwer groups, so technology associated to division algebras, so result of Saltman in the, in the mid-90s, mid this was eventually shown to be bounded. I think the original bound they got was like 22 or 24 or something like that. Um, after a lot of effort, um, uh, Paramal and Suresh got it down to 10. And then um, around um, 2010, 20, 2009 or so, um, Parma and Suresh were able to get it. Were able to get the actual result, which is eight. Um, and then this was kind of simultaneously done um, by myself and uh, Harbader and Hartman. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. But like so. Oh yes, and then and then yeah right. And then just a few years later, um, the case of much more general like uh, piadic function fields and many variables. Uh, the, these U invariants were calculated. So they do seem to behave. So by a result of leap in 2013, it, it does seem to be that if you look at, you do get the expected results that if X is like um, D dimensional and you look at its function field, then kind of every dimension makes you go up by two. So QP itself has a U invariant of four. So you get like four times, you know, two to the D. Okay. So okay. So um, okay. So quadratic form. So already, just a very basic question: like, do you have a zero or not? Um, already, like, and and can you decide based on very little information like this? 
already gives a, a very complicated, rich, rich answer. Um, besides that, you can ask, um, like, I mean, there's more information about a quadratic form than just does it have a zero, right? You might want to say, how do you classify them? How do you tell them apart, right? How do you, how do you kind of like um, parameterize ones that have various properties and stuff like that? So, um, I said 15 minutes, but I, it's not like I set a timer or something. So, okay, but, um, okay, 10 more minutes, though. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so, uh, right, so, so the, the main tool for studying these quadratic forms, which, I mean, I'm sure you guys have at least seen the definition of after, you know, after having its connection to, like, you know, the... Um, the, uh, like to A1 fundamental groups is this, there's at least the, the, this bit group, right? So, so you've probably seen this definition. Um, so given a, um, so the bit group you, uh, is the set of, um, of uh, um, isometry classes of quadratic forms. So here, isometry just means like that they're the same after some linear change of variables. Um, modulo this equivalence, um, where you say that uh, two forms are equivalent if they differ by some number of like hyperbolic planes. So there's this kind of um, very special quadratic form, um, which we could write as x squared minus y squared. I should say at this point that this f has characteristic not two to simplify the, these discussions. And so there is this basic uh, hyperbolic form. If you have um, some other, if you have two forms, you can form this um, orthogonal sum, which is just the, so th this quadratic form, this is on some vector space V, and this is on some vector space V prime, and this is just the form on the uh, direct sum of those vector spaces, where you just take, you know, where you, you know, if you're thinking of quadratic forms like bilinear forms, you're just saying that they're perpendicular to each other and just computing it on each part, right? Um, okay, or on the quadratic form, it's just the sum of the, the values. Okay, um, and so in here, you declare this equivalence by saying that a form is always gonna be equivalent to what happens if you add a hyperbolic plane, and then you extend that to an equivalence relation and that gives you um, this thing, which forms a group via this. That gives it a group structure. Uh, it, in fact, has a ring structure as well, um, which is maybe easiest to think of in terms of bilinear forms. So, uh, so given some quadratic form, there's associated to it a bilinear form, which is just where you do that, or maybe divide it by two, because like, we're not in characteristic two. So this is a way of kind of going between quadratic and bilinear forms. And, um, and if you're outside of characteristic two, then bilinear forms up to isometry and quadratic forms up to isometry are the same thing. And now, if I have like a v and a b and a v prime and a b prime, then you can form um, the tensor product, and you can think of it as the tensor product of the bilinear forms, where you just you know take the two values on simple tensors and multiply them together. And under this, under these operations, this thing turns into a ring. And this gives an extremely uh, useful way of, um, of studying uh, quadratic forms. Um, so maybe, I mean, I'm not gonna like uh, teach a class on this right now, but um, maybe just to, um, uh, just to point out one important fact, which is you might worry that uh, this notion of equivalence kind of like loses information, right? You don't want like, you don't want two forms, um, 
to somehow become equal if they weren't like, uh, if, if two forms are the same degree, then it turns out that they're going to be equivalent in this, if and only if they're actually isometric. So this is a really useful property that tells you you're not losing information. So if dimension Q equals dimension Q prime, then Q is isometric to Q prime is the same as saying the class of Q is the same as the class of Q prime. Okay, so we're, you know, this is really like actually preserving information in a surprisingly faithful way. And this is a consequence of what's usually called bit cancellation. Okay, so, um, so, so we're still, by the way, um, if, you, if you're keeping track, I was gonna count, we're still at two, Okay, um, we're, uh, I, if, if I'm going to have any kind of sanity, I can't take, I want to do, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take too much more with two, because we still have to get to three. <laughs> but, um, okay, but, so, at, at this point, though, um, let me just point out the kind of, like, famous results that tie this um, together with, uh, historically, with, um, motivic cohomology and, and all of that stuff, and that is uh, these uh, Milner conjectures. Um, so, so the point here is that there is, if you look inside um, this ring, inside of it there is this ideal which has this very naive description, this is the even dimensional um, forms. So because you're modding out by the hyperbolic plane and it's two-dimensional, it still makes sense to talk about parity of equivalence classes, parity of dimension. And you can um, define um, I in of F just to be the powers of this um, ideal. And, what, and then you can, um, and you can consider the associated graded ring with respect to this ideal. So in other words, this is just, you know, W mod I direct sum I mod I squared, et cetera. Uh, it turns out that, um, that there's this kind of surprising relationship between this and, um, and Milner K theory. So if you recall, um, for Milner K theory, This is just, you know, um, generated by um, F star as a multiplicative, as a thought of as, ad thought of as additively. So just by things that you call that. Um, and then with this, uh, with just this relation um, that um, if you look at A one minus A, uh, then you just declare that to be zero. And in, in general, we, if you have um, in the product in this ring, we just denote like that. This is all stuff that a lot of you guys have seen, probably everybody in this room, so sorry. <laughs> but anyways. Okay, but, the, but the, the crazy fact, though, is that if you look at this ring um, and you map it, um, let's say if you look at the you know degree in part of this ring, and you map it to i n mod i n plus one of, of f everywhere, by um, taking this uh, to uh, the form which is um, one minus a one tensor, so this is using the ring structure. 1 minus a n, then this gives a surjective map, which is like kind of the, the brunt of, <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, no, that's not, that's easy actually. Okay, you get a surjective map, um, and the kernel is exactly uh, multiples of 2, which, uh, I guess I don't need a little star there. 
So you get this isomorphism of the Milner K theory mod 2 and these powers of the fundamental ideal. And in fact, this kind of gives you actually a ring isomorphism um, with this and um, just the graded that. OK, so that's the, um, so that's like uh, most of the uh, Milner conjecture in some sense, or a good chunk of it. Um, and, um, and in fact, I guess because there's a talk about Gala cohomology, I should point out that uh, that these that there's a third kind of part of this uh, of this uh, of this correspondence, which is um, so both these um, are the, are isomorphic to um, to the to this Gala cohomology ring uh, with mu two coefficients. So um, I guess I should um, right. So so I guess I should I should say um, like what Gala cohomology is very quickly, since that's like all I'm going to talk about. <laughs> OK. Yeah. So, so very briefly, um, like these are, yeah, these are talks about Gala cohomology. And like, and yeah, so the definition is really, there's not much going on, right? So the, what, is, what does this thing mean? Like, so the deal is like if you have, so another, another notation for this is it's um, the cohomology our absolute Galois group into, into mu2, by which we these are really just group cohomologies. That is to say, um, so, so, not, so what, are, what, are these, what are these things? So, the, so, uh, so here, GF is the absolute Galois group. And if somebody gives you some um, M is some abelian group with a continuous uh, um, action by the absolute Galois group. So the absolute Galois group is a profinite group. As this, um, so it has this topology, and we can ask for modules which have a continuous action. Then um, these things are just when we just when we're at Galois cohomology, we really just mean the um, derived functors of the um, of the invariants. Of M. So it's you know just um, so that's the definition of Galois cohomology. If you want, um, from this perspective, though, I mean, like, like okay, like you can like look at Galois cohomology. You can take derived functors of whatever you want, but like, why should you care? And the the point is that um, because of things like like this. Uh, so let me let me kind of write it all in one the punchline is that this these gala cohomology groups um, tend to just come up repeatedly so the graded that isomorphic to this Milner K ring isomorphic to uh, gala cohomology mu2 um, so the so okay how, um, so the these Galois cohomology groups whatever they are come up over and over in classifying different kinds of objects of interest. In some sense, that's kind of like their like moral meaning. Is there a good repository for invariants? Just like cohomology, you know, groups in topology are good repository of invariants. But concretely here, like somebody gives you a quadratic form, maybe two quadratic forms, and you want to ask the question like, are they isometric? Right, and so the first thing you do is you say, well, what's their dimension? If one dimension is even and the other is odd, then check. You know the answer. <laughs> but um, but you know because the um, isometry, so you know, so they better actually have the same dimension maybe to start with, right? 
And now, if you have the same dimension, isometry is just captured by the elements in the VIT group. And so you can map them over to the VIT group, and you can say, well, um, if I look at the difference, um, I want to know if this is 0. Well, is it at least in the first fundamental ideal? OK, that's actually dimension that's actually saying are they even. You can say, OK, are they in the square of the fundamental ideal? Well, how do you figure that out? Well, you take this class, and you, um, and this, 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 uh, this thing over here gives you an isomorphism between things in i mod i squared and h1 f mu 2. And what that tells you is, OK, are they the same? Well, the, their difference gives you some invariant over here, which is um, the same as a square class. And this is uh, the discriminant is the, is the invariant associated to this. And OK, well, so, so that gives you something to measure. If, if their discriminants are the, now, if their discriminants are the same, well, that means that their difference actually um, uh, is in i squared. So, but once it's in i squared, you can say, well, is it in i cubed? And then, again, now you say, well, i, I squared mod i cubed you know, maps into this h2. It turns out that this is the uh, two-torsion part of the Brouwer group that I'll say more about very soon. So this thing has to do with classifying division algebras over the field, and it gives you another place to decide whether or not your forms are the same. If you can make that decision, then you go back and you go back and you say, well, they're in IQ, but are they in I to the fourth? The invariant lens in H3. Um, and now we start to lose our ability to interpret these objects as like familiar happy algebraic objects that we're used to. There's, um, there's not kind of a nice algebraic avatar for an H3 class in general. Um, but whatever, whatever these groups are, it starts to behoove us to understand kind of like how to think about these, these objects over here, how to tell them apart, how to write them down, how to tell if they're, um, if they're the same, et, et cetera, how to tell if they're trivial. All right. OK, so um, finally, um, let me also mention uh, the natural kind of related question that, that, this com that, that comes from this, which is, how do you write down quadratic forms? I mean, I mean, you, you, I mean, you know how to write them down, actually. But, but like, I mean, <laughs> but in this, in this context, like, if I tell you, um, if I just tell you I have a quadratic form of dimension n, then you can use, like, Gram-Schmidt, is that what it's called? And, like, diagonalize it and write it down in a nice way. But, um, but if I say, OK, well, not only is it dimension n, but maybe it's, um, maybe, OK, maybe it's also has, maybe, it, maybe it's even dimensional and has trivial discriminant in H1. Do you, can you write something down with trivial discriminant? Um, so writing quadratic forms. So writing just a general thing in W is no big deal, because that's Graham Schmidt. Writing something, well, in I, well, that's no big deal. It's just saying it's even dimensional. Writing down something in I squared, now this is saying that the discriminant has to be trivial. But basically, that's just saying that like one of the entries square class is determined by all the other ones at the end of the day. So this is also really easy to write down. Writing down something in I cubed, now this becomes a little more thoughtful. Um, it was one thing to say that this, that this particular square class was trivial and to express that in terms of the, of the coefficients. But now to say that, um, that this Brouwer class that you're getting somehow is trivial and what that means when you write it down, that's a lot more subtle. Um, so it, uh, it turns out, um, so I think this, um, uh, maybe the, was, uh, 
you know, an observation mentioned a long time ago by maybe Mercuria, but also it was kind of optimal kind of ways of writing these things were found by um, Pat Brosnan, Zenobi Reichstein, and Angelo Vistoli. That um, so you can um, write down kind of general forms um, in I cubed of f of a fixed um, dimension n, and you can do it in a. I mean, you know, they what what uh, what one can even do is kind of try to find an optimal way. Like, how many parameters do you need? to express a general such form. In general, when you're talking about optimal ways of writing things down, this is uh, the notion of essential dimension, which is something that I'm not really going to talk about too much. But essential dimension tells you basically how many parameters do you need to write down like a typical object in here, well, of dimension n or something like that. OK, so we can get some pretty reasonable bounds on kind of how many parameters you need. But it's already getting a little sticky because you know making saying that a Brouwer class is trivial is a little more complicated. I to the fourth. Well, now what does it mean for that degree three invariant to be trivial, and how do you write that down? Um, well. Um, I can't think of like a good way to quiz you guys on this. So I'll just like tell you the answer, which is that like no one knows. Okay. So it's it's not clear if there is any actual expression with like a finite number of variables that captures what it means for a quadratic form, like the general shape of a quadratic form in i to the fourth. For a given for a given dimension, if the dimension is not super small, yeah. Sorry. No, as the dimension once the dimension is beyond a certain point, you, you don't. So I guess what I'm what I'm saying is like uh, for if Q is in here and the dimension of Q is um, reasonably large, I'm not sure how big it needs to be offhand. Then it's uh, I don't. Yeah, I mean, the, so the the problem is. Um, you know, in some sense, the, the reason that it worked for H for this other one was that if you have something in I, I squared and you want to know whether it's in here, you have to say whether, what it means for an element in here to be trivial. And there's, in some sense, a way of parametrizing all possible ways of trivializing an element in H2. It's called this generic splitting variety. For H3, there's no such construction in general. And it's an open question as to whether such things exist. So that's what I mean, I guess. Yeah. Um, if the if the dimension is sufficiently small, then you can write these things down, but but only if in a in a kind of special range. Um, not clear if there exists a way of writing. These. So I mean, the, the, this is um, you know for for you people who are like kind of like vaguely topologically inspired or something like that. I mean, what we're what we're really asking about. I mean, the, I mean, you know, you this this feels like we're asking for some sort of like you know, um, um, you know, like some sort of classifying space, parameter space, moduli space, something of that shape. Um, the, of course, the problem is, of course, you know, um, quadratic forms don't really vary in moduli because once you go to the algebraic closure, they're all the same. So it's not exactly that you're making a moduli space. It's more that you're making some sort of like um, parameter space that is like that hits enough stuff Zariski topologically wise. 
like hitting everything atoll wise is easy because there's only one point. <laughs> but you want to hit everything kind of Zariski in some way. So it's like a Zariski parameter space somehow. Uh, and probably, I mean, I, I know that, um, that, that I think Bert talked about classifying spaces and child groups of classifying spaces a bit. Um, and, you know, these. The kind of classifying spaces that, that Bert probably brought up are, are close to what we're interested in here. That, that's basically the kind of things that we're talking about. Is there, a, is there some sort of uh, you know, algebraic classifying space in that sense for quadratic forms in I to the fourth with, you know, of, of some basic dimensions? And the answer is, we don't know. And if you ask me, I think there isn't. That's what I think. Yeah. They're like super explicit, yeah. Which means like, um, yeah, come to the problem session and find out. <laughs> right. But anyways, um, okay. So, um, okay, uh, we still have like 12 minutes, I guess. Am I going to three? It's like one hour, right? Yeah. It's one hour, yeah. No, no, uh, yeah, still three, right? Okay. <laughs> so, Okay, so that's good. So we still have a little bit of time. So th let's say we're done with quadratic stuff now. Let's go to three now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so um, in, my, in my notes, I'm only on page six of 19 for what I had thought I would do. Um, but hopefully I'll get through more than what I planned for lecture one this week. But I, you know, anyways, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but um, let's do higher degree forms, degree three. So um, now keep in mind, uh, so when we're doing degree three, we're, this is even, this is hard. So we're gonna like go like number of variables by number of variables, okay? So keep in mind that if I'm looking at a degree two in two variables, uh, homogeneous, that's really like looking at a degree two and one inhomogeneous variable. And that's really like looking at basically a field extension. You know, does it have a zero or not? Well, you add a zero and you get a quadratic extension, right? So these things are like um, field extensions, uh, quadratic field extensions. Doing degree three, if I have uh, two variables, well, again, we're really talking about field extensions now. These are field extensions. But already, life is much more interesting. Because in degree two, you know, n n I mean, everything is like a Galois extension. You know, everything is really nice, nice to write down. In degree three, two variable field extent. I mean, field extensions of degree three come in different flavors. Um, so if somebody gives you a field extension of degree three, then you can read off its um, discriminant, a very classical construction that gives you a degree two field extension. And depending on the shape of that degree two field extension, you know, you, that really tells you a lot about your degree three extension. So for example, if the degree two extension is actually like trivial, so to speak, if, so this is like the discriminant is like a square, as a, as a class mod squares, and if that happens to be a square, so taking the square root doesn't do anything, then this is a cyclic extension. If that quadratic extension is where you're adjoining, the, happens to be adjoining the cube roots of unity, and that's very specific, but if it happens to be that one, it's what you call a Coomer extension. So that is to say it has the form, you know, f adjoin cube root of a or something like that. That's, that's this kind of discriminant. Now, Coomer extension, and, and then there's the rest, which is another story which we can talk about later. <laughs> but, but for the Coomer extensions, these are really nice because we know how to write them down, right? You can, you, not only, we can kind of like, so we've kind of like classified, and now we're at the, at the last stage, which is like, how do you actually write them down? You can write down Coomer extensions. Uh, how do you write down cyclic extensions, though? of degree three. I don't 
don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, so you can, but it's hard. It's actually hard. Okay, so, you know, is there like a nice param like, like parameter space for degree three extensions? Can you write them down? Yes, it turns out there's a nice one-dimensional parameter space. There's a few different ways of writing it. Let me give an example. So really, this amounts to writing down the general form of a cubic polynomial that gives you a cyclic extension. Um, so here's, here's, here's one. This one is not my favorite, but it's like really easy to write. Uh, tx squared plus t minus 3x plus 1. Okay? So this polynomial, this particular degree 3 polynomial, gives you a cubic uh, cyclic extension of degree 3. And any cyclic extension of degree 3 always can be rewritten. If you can find an element in that field extension that has that, something in that form, it's minimal polynomial for some t. OK. But you can see, like, life is rapidly getting more complicated, <laughs> right? Like, how do you write down, like, you know, how do you write down the general degree three thing? That's easy. It's just a general degree three polynomial. How do you write it down with specific invariants? It starts getting complicated. And we're only at, like, the smallest case of two variables. Um, how about... Uh, how about uh, three variables? Three variables. Now things get really crazy, right? Because now we start getting moduli. So unlike the last thing, if you have a field extension, every field extension of the algebraic closure looks the same, every degree three separable extension. But when you have a cubic form in three variables, the zeros of your form is a genus one curve. And it's, uh, the Jacobian of that curve is some elliptic curve, which has a J invariant. And that J invariant is some number that tells these curves apart even at the algebraic closure. So you, these vary in kind of one-dimensional uh, geometric moduli, the J line. And, OK, and that is to say, like, that's like another subject that we're just not even, this is when we start shying away from, from like, you know, we say, OK, maybe that's not what we're going to look at, because that's like a different conference entirely, right? OK. But, OK, but how about, how about singular genus one curves? I mean, why, why were we looking at, like, these non-singular ones? If you look at very singular ones, like things like which at the algebraic closure look like that, these now don't vary in moduli, but um, but turn out to this is this thing is really uh, really three points in the dual projective space, which is really like a basically a, a you know a degree three field extension if you will. These things really correspond again to cubic field extensions, you know, things at the algebraic closure that look like that are really degree three cubic field extensions where you're looking at the norm equals zero. So these things kind of are naturally arising again in an interesting arithmetically parameterized way as norm forms of cubic extensions. And so this makes us happy because we have a nice algebraic interpretation of these things in terms of like, Algebraic objects that we like, you know, field extensions, for example. Uh, let's say if we go four variables, now we're talking about cubic hypersurfaces, which, I mean, I, I can't really say that's not the subject of, I mean, I'm sure some people are talking about this in enumerative ways it's in, at some point in this conference, maybe. So it's, so it's okay. It's, so it's not, it's not not the subject of, of our conference, but it's not the subject of my talks in this conference. These vary in moduli in interesting ways. So, so cubic surfaces you know, vary, uh, have kind of a four-dimensional geometric moduli. Instead of the one-dimensional J-line, they have like four-dimension geometric moduli. Um, and so there are much more complicated things. But 
there are some particularly nice ones. For example, if I look at the equation norm of some cubic extension has some particular value, if I you know, homogenize that, I get an, a, a well, somewhat singular um, cubic, um, cubic surface. Um, but this thing starts to have some much more interesting arithmetic to it. So um, I guess uh, because I've totally squandered all my time, um, this was my, OK, so this is my segue into Brouwer groups. That, um, so you'll just have to remember that for tomorrow. <laughs> but um, but the, 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 so the punchline is that this nice little four-variable singular form um, is really what's telling us, what starts to tell us that we're like kind of breaking this problem up in the wrong way. So what, will, what, you, what, you, what you find is that, at least in the case where E over F is a cyclic cubic extension, that, um, that this thing, even though it's a singular cubic surface in P3, um, if you embed it in, I didn't figure out what, what P this was. You can embed it in, for example, in um, the like, 3 9 Grassmannian, for example, as a smooth, as a nice, naturally, as a nice smooth variety. Um, and it gives you, so this is like some, the affi this affine thing sits as a nice affine thing and something that embeds nicely in this 3 9 Grassmannian, which, um, which reflects um, the, um, the, uh, some, which reads off the arithmetic of a, of a nine-dimensional um, central simple algebra over the field. So there's, so there's a, an algebra associated with this cubic extension and this B. Um, and, and so this, it turns out, like, this form is, like, is like much more interesting you know, than like, some typical cubic form. Unfortunately, looking at it like this, it's like a little unnatural because we're not even finding it in the place where it wants to live. It's like kind of embedding here in a weird singular way. And so basically the, the punchline here is like instead of kind of going like kind of degree wise, it makes more sense to actually like um, shift and say, well, instead of thinking about did we really actually, actually did we really even care about like so this is, this is an interesting thing, right? Um, like, I told you in the beginning, field arithmetic is about like, which equations have solutions and which ones don't. But that's like, actually really horrible and boring, right? I mean, like, because it, like, it's not like what we actually do in our lives is like somebody comes up to us with like, some system of equations, right? Actually, one of my colleagues did um, like, last year, and I, I couldn't help them. You know, I mean, like, because like that's not that doesn't really reflect what's really going on. What really happens is like there are certain algebraic structures, geometric structures of interest that we like because of their interesting intrinsic, you know, geometry and algebra that then give us some interesting systems of equations that we find interesting and then we study. Right? Isn't that usually what happens? So so like let's so here's where we just abandon this. And we say that what we at least found is that there are some natural classes that pop up. Quadratic forms are like strangely beautiful. A lot of good structure is there. Higher dimensional forms are much more sparse. Certain ones reflect various algebraic structures of interest. Those are the ones we focus on. Um, and the rest, at least for, for the other three lectures, we will not discuss. But OK. so. Um, yeah, so, so <laughs> next time I'll actually talk about something advertised in the title of the talk. Um, I'll talk about um, Brouwer group and the symbol length problem next time. So that's, that's where we are. I think that's, that's it. Thanks very much.